So let's have begin with our senior. Yes, sir. Um, so I think many young people do not understand why Catholics should not take communion in other denominations. Can you explain why we should not? Well, uh, Holy Communion is really our relationship with both Christ and the Church. Uh, and so when we're receiving Holy Communion, we're saying we're completely in communion with Christ and His Church. And so for us, communion means body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, whereas in some of the other traditions of faith, uh, it doesn't mean that. It means it's a memorial, or it means it's a symbol, but it's not considered Christ as body and blood. And so for us to remain true to ourselves as uh, Roman Catholic Christians, uh, we abstain from communion in, the, in, in receiving whatever they're offering, uh, but we still are in communion with them in prayer, and, and one with them in prayer. So that would be the short answer I'd give you. Great question, thank you. Yes, sir. And it's all about that bow tie. I <laughs> Once we're confirmed in the Catholic Church, are we always Catholic even if we stop um, attending Mass? Actually, whenever you are baptized Roman Catholic, you were always a Roman Catholic. And so baptism, first communion, and confirmation are the three sacraments of initiation, uh, no matter what happens in your life. Uh, now, you can become a non-practicing Catholic, but still, you are baptized in the Catholic Church, and that is forever, forever. So, great question. All right, so um, I was curious to hear what your favorite saint was and why. Yeah, actually, I, uh, it, it, we're going to really end up with multiple. So uh, St. Andrew is the, my, my confirmation saint, and I went to St. Andrew's school in New Orleans, so that's, that's kind of where that connection is, and of course, as an apostle and also a fisherman, because I like to fish. Uh, and I'm an apostle now, so there we go. <laughs> you got both of them, got two for two. Yeah. And then uh, when I was doing my studies, you know, for theology, St. Clement of, of Rome was really important, uh, you know, and I did one of my theses on him, because he was the next pope right after St. Peter. Yeah. And uh, it really was, I think, a revelation for me. But then as, as I've grown up, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola, Jesuits taught me, so very, very strong. Um, St. Basil, who is uh, what really started our monastic life with Benedict, um, and the Brazilians uh, helped. Uh, and then uh, I would say St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, really powerful. Uh, you know, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, powerful yeah. in, in this modern age, uh, you know, very much so. So those would be just some of the saints that have kind of affected me, uh, but you're right on, that's what it's about, to really learn from them and share their life and their love of Jesus. Right. I mean, it's really powerful, it's powerful. Yes, ma'am. What would you have to say to any young people that are questioning the Catholic Church or their faith in God? So they're, they're questioning it? Yes, sir. Okay, so I would say, you know, uh, the church, really does offer the truth. The church really does offer a special love relationship. And so I would invite them to really take a hard look at their love relationship with God and to um, really um, seek God. Because the world is not supporting that. The world is really speaking another language, if you will which is away from God. Um, so I really encourage them to, to continue to grow in their relationship with God and with his church especially. So, yeah, wonderful. All right. Uh, so, um, this question is a little simpler, but really, uh, what's the church teaching on Catholics having relations with non-Catholics, as in like dating and marriage? Thank you. So we're supportive, um, you know, uh, Generally, to uh, receive the sacrament of marriage, uh, you need to have two people that are baptized, and they can be baptized in other traditions. They don't have to be baptized in the Catholic Church. Um, and so we're supportive, uh, and 
just encourage, though, all of our folk, especially, to remain true to who they are and who we are as a church. And uh, when I have a couple that's like a mixed religion couple like that, I have a talk with them about, okay, what's the tradition you've grown up in and what's the tradition you've grown up in? And get them to share faith together, begin to pray together, begin to read the word together, and begin to come to church together. That's when they really become strong in faith, even though it's a mixed religion. So, great question. Wonderful. Um, usually around the teenage age is when a lot of teenagers drift farther away from God. What are some forms of prayer or types of prayer that you think teenagers should be trying to use? Okay. Well, I, I think, you know, the, the, the four prayer forms that we have been teaching y'all and we went over today with you are what I would really encourage our teenagers to practice in their lives. Uh, and so, uh, Lexio Divina, to be able to enter into the Word of God and let the Word speak to us, both with individual words or phrases, and then what's the meaning. Uh, also, the imagination prayer that St. Saint, Saint, Saint Ignatius taught us, very special to us, to be able to enter into the Scripture in imagination. And then uh, Visio Divina, to have those special images that are really inviting us into relationship with God, and of course, intercessory prayer. So I encourage them to, to do that. Um, and then I encourage you to help teach them to do that. So. Okay, so my question was actually a question I had a year ago when we, there was a relic right here. And it was kind of strange to me because I had never seen one. And it almost looked, well, very strange. So I wanted to ask, what's the, like, the importance of the relics to the church? So the relics uh, are uh, special to us as, as church because they are... Uh, they are literally part of our loved ones that are we consider with God in heaven. So they're part of the communion of saints, if you will. Uh, and it's a physical, physical part. Uh, and so it's a reminder to us in a very special way of all those that have gone before us that have fallen in love with Jesus Christ and that really want to continue to to share that love. And so we ask them to, to help us. We ask them to intercede for us so that when we're not praying, they're praying for us. Uh, so um, I don't know which relic you had here. Uh, it was a piece of a bone, and that was the reason why it surprised me. Yeah. It was, I was like, bone, why, why wouldn't you just take a cloth? You know? So we actually could do that right. too. You could do that too. Um, so on the altar in my chapel at my house, I actually have the privilege of having most of the relics of all of the saints that we venerate each month. And wow. so like today, St. Titus and St. Timothy, and to have a relic of them there. It's, it's a really personal moment and letting their faith touch my faith. And so Timothy being the, the Bishop of Ephesus when Mary lived there. Mm -hmm. And then Titus being the Bishop of Crete, the island of Crete, uh, and uh, being an example. So really powerful. And they were people that were converted to the faith through St. Paul. So that's really what's going on now because of our young people that we just had at Mass that are, are joining us as church. Those five young people really encouraging. Yeah. It's great, interesting to see great that. Question. Yes, so I know you probably get this question a lot, but this happens to be one of the bigger topics in, in my religion class. But it's why can't women become priests? Because Mary Magdalene was a, an important discipline, but it also seems that the only reason that they weren't a part of the Twelve was because of custom and secular laws and of, of a time treating women like chattel. So part of it was uh, tradition. You know, I think that uh, uh, men were... Uh, the ones that Jesus called. And Mary Magdalene was important to Jesus, and she was called to discipleship. And there were other women, you know, Salome, and uh, um, of course, Mary, the mother of God, was called to be uh, a disciple of Jesus. So there's nothing preventing our, our women to continue to be disciples. In fact, in all truth, uh, if you knew about my life, even though I'm the bishop, the women run the church. 
when it really was the church. Uh, they, they are so filled with faith. They are so filled with hope. They are so filled with love. That you, there's no way to contain that, and I wouldn't want to. I mean, the women are just wonderful. Um, you know, I, I, I don't really know the, the complete answer why Jesus just chose men, although I would say in that tradition, uh, it would have been hard for a woman to be a priest because she would not have been accepted. Um, and I know now that, you know, that we have a, a wider view. The call, though, is to image Jesus in our very flesh. And so, as men, we are imaging Jesus in our very flesh. Now, women can still do that, and we do have opportunities for them to do that. And they are in major leadership circumstances in the church. Um, the other thing, I think Jesus was trying to tell us that, you know, we really want the men to be a part of the church. Really want the men to be a part of a church. And so having the men be in a specific leadership role is saying to the men, don't stand outside the church and just smoke your cigarette. Come on in. Come on in. The women are already there. They want to come. So they want to be there with us. So, um, and it's been an honor to be called to be a priest and to serve as a priest. So, and I invite each of you to consider what is the Lord calling you to? Who is the Lord calling you to be? So, great question. Okay. So, do we have another question on your end? Yes, sir. Um, when it comes to horoscopes, zodiac signs, tarot cards, and things of that nature, what does like what is the church's position? Um, the church's basic position is, nah. There. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. I mean, to be able to predict a person's movements or a person's actions. From just the stars, not far fetched. Pretty much, yeah. you know, with the with the millions and millions of stars there are, and um, so no. Um, what where we're really called to be is people of faith in Jesus Christ, and really trust in Him, and let our put our lives in His hands, and let Him lead us and guide us, and not put our hands put our lives in the hands of a horoscope or a tarot card or whatever else. So, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Um, I have more personal question for you. Um, how was it transitioning from just a priest to a bishop and did you have to take like any other classes or did you have to make a lot of really big transitions that just seems like a little harder to make? Yeah, well, it was, a, it was a heck of a transition. I wasn't expecting the phone call uh, to begin with and so yeah, exactly. Uh, and the question was, the Holy Father, Pope uh, Francis, wants you to be the fourth bishop of the Diocese of Biloxi, Mississippi, will you accept? Uh, so we had a bit of a conversation about that, and eventually I said yes. So it meant that I had to leave Corpus Christi, Texas, move to Mississippi, uh, and get to know the people here, and really and get to know you, which has been wonderful, uh, and, and to, to, to really uh, plant myself here in ministry and in service. So uh, it's been a blessing, been a very a wonderful blessing. So the last four years, it's hard to believe it's been four years. So I think time has got us, so I'm going to give you a blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well done. Great questions. I appreciate it.